Welcome everyone uh, to the 10th annual Tom E. Moses Memorial Lecture on the United States Constitution. Uh, my name is Ray Smock. I'm the director of the Robert C. Byrd Center for Legislative Studies. And my first order of business is to ask you if you would please silence your cell phones. And uh, let me also, while we're doing housekeeping chores, mention that right after, uh, after, after uh, uh, Mr. Risen's lecture, we will have a little brief period of question and answer. And uh, then we will retire to the rotunda where we will have refreshments and you will all buy his book, <laughs> which he will be glad to sign. So uh, please join us after that. And if you do have a question uh, or a comment to make after the talk, if you would make your way, if it's convenient, to make your way to the, uh, to the microphones, uh, this means that when we put this on our YouTube channel, we'll be able to hear the comments as well. Uh, uh, as, as being mic'd for the, for the TV camera back there. Uh, and uh, so, so, so please come up to the microphones if you would at that time. Uh, th this uh, uh, lecture series had its, its origins in, in 2004 when the late Senator Robert C. Byrd inserted language into an appropriations bill that required all schools and federal agencies and colleges and universities, anyone who got federal dollars and that's almost everybody, to take time on or about September 17th each year uh, to reflect on the United States Constitution. Uh, that was in an appropriations bill in 2004, and President George Bush signed that, so it's a bipartisan effort to, to uh, uh, celebrate uh, Constitution Day. And um, Senator Byrd gave the first lecture in this series in 2005, and since then we have continue to invite distinguished speakers uh, to share their insights into the U.S. Constitution and related topics uh, on American constitutional uh, history and civil liberties. This lecture is named for the late Tommy Moses, that's his photograph right there, uh, a defender of the Bill of Rights, a founder of the Eastern Panhandle branch of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, the lecture is supported by uh, uh, his three daughters, uh, Lynn Moses Yellett, Merrill Crawford, and Jerry Moses Eichler, who are here, and other members of the family are here with us tonight. And we thank you very much for your continued support of this series. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the uh, Bird Center staff who made the arrangements and for Constitution Day, uh, Dr. Jay Wyatt, our Director of Programs and Research, uh, Mr. Jody Brummage, our office manager and archivist, and our university student interns, uh, Casey DeHaven, uh, Mallory uh, Matos, uh, Dylan Rosenleib, and uh, Sarah Brennan. Uh, these are Shepherd University students who play an integral part in our processing of Senator Byrd's papers. And uh, we uh, appreciate their help in their, uh, in their work. A lot of them have written blogs about things they've discovered, which you can find on our, our website. Tonight we have is our uh, speaker, Clay Risen, editor at the New York Times in the op-ed section, and the author of The Bill of, of the Century, The Epic Battle for the Civil Rights Act. And tonight he will talk about the Civil Rights Act and the American Constitution. Uh, Clay previously served as an assistant editor at the New Republic and uh, was the founding managing editor of the quarterly journal Democracy. His recent writing has appeared in Fortune, The New Republic, Popular Science, and Slate. Clay's first book, A Nation on Fire, America in the Wake of the King Assassination, was hailed as a crucial addition to the civil rights history by Publishers Weekly. And what's so good about his latest book, the, the Bill of the Century, is that he shows how many people and how many organizations and various forces inside Congress and outside Congress and across the nation played roles uh, beyond those that are portrayed in our textbooks uh, about how the Civil Rights Bill was, was actually passed. And oftentimes we see it uh, from only the perspective of Lyndon Johnson, uh, 
and or or Martin Luther King, and while both uh, played vital roles, uh, it is a far more complicated story th th than than that. Um, so his 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 book puts Congress uh, and others in a context that I find incredibly important. It's really good, solid congressional history, of the kind that we need more of. Clay is also the author of American Whiskey, Bourbon and Rye, A Guide to the Nation's Favorite Spirit. I'll come back to that in a minute. I had the pleasure of hearing Clay speak at the National uh, Book Festival in Washington, D.C. over Labor Day uh, weekend. Some of you here tonight were on a trip that we took down to the, to the festival that uh, weekend. He talked about how he came to write two books on the topic of, of, civil, of the civil rights era. Uh, he wanted to know more about what happened. He wanted to understand its impact from the standpoint of his generation, a newer generation, than those who were born and who lived through uh, the efforts of the 1960s. He wondered how successful it had all been when he saw signs of it starting to unravel uh, in the 1980s and afterwards. So what a perfect reason to write books, to learn more about important subjects, and to answer questions that are in your own mind. Now a word about his book on whiskey. I read this book this past weekend while sipping on a modest amount of Woodford Reserve Double Oak Kentucky Straight Bourbon, <laughs> which he gives two and a half stars, I think, maybe three. Uh, the book is a guide to the best uh, whiskey uh, uh, in, the, in America, but it opens with an absolutely wonderful, succinct history of the role of whiskey in American history. And what does whiskey have to do with the United States Constitution? Uh, more than you might think. Uh, although that's not why he wrote the book. It was not a constitutional study. But I would say that the history of whiskey is American history in liquid form. <laughs> the Whiskey Rebellion of the 1790s, President George Washington had to send an army of 15,000 troops into Pennsylvania to get the farmer distillers to pay the tax on, on, on their whiskey. And we've been paying taxes ever since. Uh, and it was whiskey and other alcoholic beverages that are responsible for two constitutional amendments, the 18th and the 21st. The Constitution is everywhere, even in a bottle of whiskey. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Clay Risen. This hooked up here. We can talk about whiskey later. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. But tonight I'd like to talk about the Constitution and the Civil Rights Act. First of all, I'd like to thank the Bird Center and the staff here. who have been incredibly generous, gracious to invite me, generous in helping me get here and, and uh, welcoming me into the center, uh, as well as Shepherd University. Uh, this is uh, a wonderful institution, and, and this lecture series is a, a wonderful wonderful event, and uh, I'm just very proud to be a part of uh, this ongoing series. It's, it's obviously, it's very fitting uh, and, and appropriate to talk about the Civil Rights Act in relationship to the Constitution, uh, not only because it, they both deal with fundamental legal questions, but I would argue that uh, not only did the Civil Rights Act tear down uh, injustice in this country, but it also fundamentally shaped or reshaped the way that we think about the Constitution. And in doing the research for, uh, for the book and in writing the book, it was striking to me how central not only the Constitution as a theme, but the Constitution as a, as a point of debate was to the discussions within the Department of Justice, within uh, the White House, within uh, different Senate offices, House offices, and of course on the floor of the House and Senate. Members of Congress, members of the White House staff and the Department of Justice took the questions very seriously and, and sought not only to make the bill fit into the Constitution, but to find ways in which the bill could expand what we understand the Constitution to be. Today we take it for granted that, of, of course, the federal government can 
for example, mandate that private businesses cannot discriminate against people based on race in terms of serving them at restaurants or employing them in businesses. And if we can't exactly cite chapter and verse or article and clause of where this comes from in the Constitution, we have a general sense that that is in accord with we the people. But this was not the case in the 1960s. This was not at all obvious. Many people on both sides of the issue, even people who felt adamant about passing a civil rights bill, had real concerns about whether the government in fact had the constitutional power to put measures like this into effect. Now today we find these laughable. When last year Rand Paul suggested that he was not sure that Title II of the, Con of the Civil Rights Act was constitutional, he was laughed at. People said, well, of course it is. But all he was doing, and not to excuse him, but all he was doing was digging up an argument that was very legitimate, or taken as legitimate, 50 years prior. And while it's easy to look back at the opponents of the bill at the time as these sort of racist troglodytes, it was not at all the case. The Southern Democrats were, the ranks of the Southern Democrats were filled with top-notch legal minds. Senator Sam Irvin from North Carolina had been a justice on the state Supreme Court before becoming a senator. Richard Russell, Robert Byrd, these men knew the legislative legal story behind every piece of legislation that went through. They were intricately and, and brilliantly informed and brilliant debaters. And they weren't the only ones who brought serious legal questions, constitutional questions against this bill. John Satterfield, who was the head lobbyist for uh, an organization called the uh, very sort of uh, anodyne name, the Coordinating Committee for Fundamental American Freedoms, which was a clearinghouse of uh, groups that opposed the Civil Rights Act. He was the former president of the American Bar Association. Also arrayed against the bill were legal scholars like Robert Bork, who would go on to become a Supreme Court nominee by, uh, president, Ken by president Reagan, and made several serious arguments in journals like, well, The New Republic, uh, National Review, as well as Chicago, the Chicago Tribune. This was an, a line of argument or the constitutional argument against the bill was something that didn't simply exist on the fringes or wasn't simply something that people threw up as, uh, as a point of, uh, to create an obstacle. Rather, it was something that was very central in the minds of a large part of mainstream America. And yet, by the end of 1964, not only had the bill passed through the House and Senate and reached President Johnson's desk, but it had been taken to the Supreme Court in the landmark Heart of Atlanta versus United States case where a unanimous Supreme Court decided for title, in this case, Title II, but decided for the constitutionality of the Civil Rights Bill. So as we look back at the bill, it's important to recognize that it represents not one, but two victories. Uh, first of all is the substance of the bill. It expanded rights dramatically for African Americans as well as for other minorities and for women. Uh, or, around the country and, and in perpetuity. But it also meant a, a, an acceptance on the part of the country, and, and not just on the part of the Supreme Court or the, or the Congress, but on the part of, I would say, the, the whole country, that there was a new and broader understanding of the Constitution that we now had to grapple with and we have benefited from ever since. Now let's, let's start by discussing when I talk about the Civil Rights Act and the Constitution, there are really two parts of it that came under uh, the most scrutiny. There were 11 titles to the bill, but the two that I'd like to focus on are Title II and Title VII. And they're really probably the most famous titles. Title II famously banned Jim Crow uh, in its most obvious expression. It outlawed discrimina discrimination against African Americans on the, in restaurants and hotels and theaters and basically public accommodations, as they were called, businesses that were open to the public. Title VII, which we now know mostly through its, uh, the agency it created, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, banned discrimination in the private workplace. Managers and owners could not hire, fire, or promote people or refuse to do those things on the basis of someone's skin color. Uh, gender was actually added as an amendment later in, in the debate, but, uh, but Title VII was, was fundamentally uh, about, uh, about opening up the workplace uh, and requiring businesses to do so. 
Now, unlike other parts of the bill, these were radical ideas. These were new ideas, particularly at the federal level. There were a lot of states and, and local governments that already had non-discrimination policies, uh, laws, ordinances on their books, whether it was with regards to public accommodations or when it were private businesses and uh, non-discrimination in the workplace. But really nothing had ever, no one had ever really given serious weight to the idea that the federal government should take this on. And, and immediately the question arose, well, you know, this is a great idea. And this was as they were debating it in, in the Department of Justice writing the bill before it went to Congress, people immediately said, well, this is a great idea. We should do these things. But is it constitutional? How do we, how do we justify doing this? There were two options that the drafters of the bill immediately grabbed onto. The first was the 14th Amendment and the promise of equal protection in that amendment. And the second was Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, better known as the Commerce Clause, which gives the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, each of these had their advantages and disadvantages. The 14th Amendment approach, which was, was essentially limited to state action. It said that the state government or the, the state, the federal government, cannot discriminate. And it was understood that that also meant anyone who had, who, who operated under the color of the federal government. So if you had a license, for example, or if you had a license from a state government, uh, you could not discriminate. So if you were a lawyer or uh, a, a, a barber, for example, you, as long as you had a license, you were operating to some extent as an agent of the state, uh, or it could be interpreted that way, and therefore you could be required not to discriminate because that's what the 14th Amendment provided for. But there was a problem with this in that, first of all, not all businesses need licenses. Furthermore, you could imagine, and people said it immediately, well, what if you told Mississippi, hey, everybody that you give licenses to, you now have to require them not to discriminate. Mississippi could simply say, well, we're just not going to license anybody. So from now on, barbers don't need licenses, lawyers don't need licenses, they're just purely private. And so 14th Amendment doesn't cover them. And, and maybe the biggest objection was the, a, an old post-reconstruction Supreme Court decision which had significantly reduced and, and limited the scope of uh, 14th Amendment action on behalf of civil rights. So it cast serious question over whether you could actually go this far in requiring businesses not to discriminate simply because they had a license from the state. And this, so, so this was complicated. And there was, uh, there was a lot of doubt about whether this was really a, a, a useful tool, particularly when weighed against the alternative, which was the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause by 19, the 1960s had come to be understood to be a fairly expansive tool. Any type of business, any business which fit into a type of business that might do inter, might traffic in interstate commerce could be regulated by the federal government and could be regulated in, in ways that were not necessarily obviously commerce. So for example, if you were a restaurant, even if you were a fairly small restaurant, as long as restaurants like yours bought food from other states, sold food to people who came in from other states, then you could be regulated by the federal government. And the federal government could come and tell you, you cannot discriminate. The problem was that, particularly in the South, there were a lot of restaurants that pretty much, pretty demonstrably did not do any business in interstate terms and could be thought of almost as a class of business. You know, small, small town restaurants and, and local and, and stores. These arguably under, uh, with the right lawyer, could be pulled away from the hold of a Commerce Clause backed uh, title. So this was, this was a problem. Furthermore, there was a political question. By and large, Republicans lined up between, behind the 14th Amendment and, Republic, and Democrats lined up behind the Commerce Clause. That's because the 14th Amendment was a Republican passed amendment. It was passed by uh, Reconstruction era con uh, Congress. It uh, was dominated by Republicans. It was written by Republicans. It was, for every Republican who loved to think of the party as the party of Lincoln, the 14th Amendment was part of their founding document, or was one of their founding documents. The Commerce Clause, on the other hand, was a tool that had essentially enabled the New Deal to come into its own. It was the tool that uh, 
the Roosevelt administration used to justify its expansive regulatory and, and spending powers during the New Deal. So there's a lot of debate about which one, which one to use. And, and ultimately, in order to get Republicans to support the bill, the drafters of the bill went with both of them and said, fundamentally, we think the Commerce Clause is enough to justify, to make this bill constitutional. But just in case, we're also going to say it's justified by the 14th Amendment. And actually, that worked. A lot of Republicans said, well, you know, okay, I can get behind that because you mentioned art. And that's kind of how Congress works sometimes. Uh, believe it or not, sometimes it's as simple as just saying, giving people credit. Uh, against this stood the bill's opponents. And they had two primary constitutional objections. One of them very specific, one of them more general. The specific objection was that banning discrimination by business owners and employers was a violation of private property, property rights. It was an unconstitutional taking. It was telling people what they could do or could not do with their property. And the more general objection, uh, and, and the more general objection was that the bill represented the imposition of a majority's view on the minority. Majority views change, minorities view, minority views change. People said, look, at the moment, people want to have a Civil Rights Act that forces a large, major a large minority of people to do something they don't want to do. Well, that kind of goes against a lot of the founding ideas in the Constitution, that, that the majority cannot necessarily force the minority to do anything at once. The minority has to have rights. This was actually best expressed, and this was the fundamental objection by Robert Bork, uh, who at the time was a, a rising star in the legal world. He wrote a long essay criticizing the bill in The New Republic. He wrote that the principle of such legislation is that if I find your behavior ugly by my standards, moral or aesthetic, and if you prove stubborn about adopting my view of the situation, then I am justified in having the state coerce you into more righteous paths. That is itself a principle of unsurpassed ugliness. Note that both of these objections were quite clever in the way they were constructed. They were designed to avoid any advocacy of racism or segregation as such. They were simply about defending liberty and about defending private property. In fact, there's a large section of Bork's article where he says, now I'm not racist. I'm not, I don't support segregation, but I believe that people should have the right to do those things. That was, that was his point of view, and it was a point of view that a lot of people held. Fortunately, the bill supporters didn't take this challenge lightly. The original bill was sketched and drafted by the Justice Department, along with input from the White House. And in, in fact, I should mention as an aside, one of the young lawyers at the time, a young lawyer, who helped draft that, lit, that language and later helped revise it, a man named David Filberoff, who went on to become the dean of the law school at the University of Buffalo, passed away last week. He was a, a, uh, a key source for me, both in terms of the voluminous archives that he kept from his time there, as well as uh, some very helpful comments uh, that he gave to me in an interview uh, at his home in Buffalo. So it's, uh, it's also fitting that I should be talking about his role today. Phil Veroff and a crack team of brilliant young legal minds working underneath Bobby Kennedy not only wrote the bill with a keen eye to passing constitutional muster, but they also put together what came to be known as the Green Book. And the Green Book, it was literally in a green binder, a thick green binder, was sent around to all the members of Congress who supported the bill, as well as to groups around the country who asked for one. Uh, and, and hundreds of groups militated behind this bill, civil rights groups, labor groups, church groups, synagogues. Uh, it's a whole other story, but it's, uh, it's an important part of the story behind the bill, and the, and the Department of Justice was very happy to help them. So they sent them this book. And what was in the book? The book was a title by title, almost you know, section by section analysis, explanation, essentially a, a playbook for the bill. It said, here's why we need the, this title, here's what this title does, here's what all the parts do, here's what we considered doing but didn't, and here's why we didn't do that, here's why it's constitutional. And they had a constitutional, thick constitutional section for each one, as well as answers to obvious arguments. So that if you were a House member or a Senate member and you were on the floor 
And let's say you weren't a legal scholar. Let's say you didn't really know much about the bill, but you supported the bill. Uh, if you went to the floor and it was your turn to debate, and Sam Irvin got up and started peppering you with these seemingly very arcane, very uh, nuanced questions, you would actually have answers to everything right there. And the Green Book was essentially made two arguments when it comes to these two planks, uh, Title II and Title VII, for their constitutionality. First of all, it said that discrimination in public accommodations and in, and in businesses, so Title II and Title VII, had a direct impact on commerce. So it wasn't just that the government had the right through the Commerce Clause to regulate private businesses, but actually it had a commercial interest in doing so. It spoke directly to the Commerce Clause, the substance of the Commerce Clause. They argued that as the economy became more intertwined, as more people traveled around the, across state lines to do business or for pleasure, they had a constitutional right to expect the same basic access to goods and services everywhere. So that if a black couple from New York City was down in Georgia, they should have the constitutional right to expect that they can go to a hotel and get the same goods and services that they would expect to get in New York City. They wouldn't have to hunt around uh, and, uh, and try to find a hotel. In fact, probably those couples or that couple wouldn't go to Georgia for fun uh, for a variety of reasons, but one, one of which being they couldn't find, they couldn't get service. Now that's a direct impact on commerce. The federal government and the Green Book argued, therefore the federal government, and no one else is going to do anything about this. Georgia's certainly not going to do anything about it. New York can't do anything about it. So it's up to the federal government to regulate it. This is the idea behind the Commerce Clause. Moreover, it, let's say you're a business in the South who, you know, a business owner who either maybe you want to serve blacks or you just, it doesn't matter to you one way or the other. The way that Jim Crow worked, even if there wasn't a law specifically saying that you couldn't serve blacks, there was a, an understanding that you couldn't. So that meant that you couldn't do commerce the way you wanted to. Your commercial interests were impeded. Again, only the federal government could do something about that. Second, they argued, or they posited, they presented evidence. The courts had already upheld a lot of several executive and congressional actions to ban discrimination in public travel, in, in interstate travel. So, for example, on buses or in trains, the federal government had already acted to ban discrimination in those modes of, con of, of, of commerce. So it only made sense that, well, by extension, interstate travel involved whatever you did when you got to where you were going. So if the federal government had the power to regulate the transit, it probably also should have the power to regulate what those transitors, what those people on that transit did once they got there or what, what they were able to do. Third, they argued that when it came to the private property objection, if that point was legitimate, then all regulatory action was unconstitutional. Any law that restricted someone from or prevented someone or restricted what someone could do with their goods and services, including well-established acts like the Food and Pure Food and Drug Act or uh, age requirements for liquor sales, faced the same charge of coercion over pro private property. And yet this idea that if you sold goods or services to the public, you were opening yourself up to some form of regulation was not originated by the Constitution. It was deeply rooted in English common law. This was something that had been around for, for hundreds of years. It was a well-established fact. So even though it sounded good to get up and rail about private property and coercion, it was already a settled question that yes, states, local governments, and certainly the federal government, they do have the power to, within reason, regulate private property. Now, the debates that took place on the House and Senate floor are full of deep constitutional discourse. It's very interesting to go read them, particularly when very, very well-informed debaters uh, are there talking about the nuances and the constitutionality of these laws. Some people that we don't really remember today, uh, Senator Pastore from Rhode Island was an amazing debater. and was actually someone that the team behind the bill, Hubert Humphrey and, uh, and uh, Tommy Kekel, who is a senator from uh, California were sort of running the bill in the Senate. They picked Pastore repeatedly. They said, you go out, you're, you're our knight. 
you need, you, because he could run circles, rhetorical circles, as well as intellectual circles around even men like Sam Irvin. But nevertheless, you know, these were theater. I mean, the, uh, this was theater on some level. No one was being convinced, per se. Uh, there were very few senators or congressmen who said, OK, well, I, I've heard the debate. Now I'm, in fact, a lot of them were never, a lot of them never really went to the Senate floor to hear these debates. <laughs> Again, uh, that's part of how the Senate works. Um, the real work happened behind the scenes with meetings at the White House, meetings in Humphrey's office, meetings in the office of, of uh, uh, Everett Dirksen, who was the Senate minority leader, the Republican minority leader, uh, where, where compromises and, and debates were really hashed out. But, but I would still argue that this constitutional debate that took place using the Green Book against the arguments posited by the opponents of the bill were absolutely critical for the bill's passage and for its lasting place in the American political culture. First of all, it helped educate the public about the constitutional need for the bill. In February of 1964, the Chicago Tribune, whose editorial board was vehemently against the bill, it was really again, strongly against the bill, ran an 11-part editorial where they took down or attacked the bill on constitutional grounds, title by title. In response, and, and on the other side, editorial boards that were more liberal, that were in favor of the bill, did the same thing. All of them drew on the arguments that are coming out of the Green Book, were coming out of guys like Robert Bork and Sam Irvin. The debate that was happening within Congress and around the bill fueled and, and, and gave substance to the debate that people like you and I, people in parts around the country, read at the morning breakfast table, discussed at work, it became the, the, the root of public debate about the bill. Obviously, people didn't necessarily appreciate the nuances of English common law and things like that. But by the time it got to them, by the time it was processed and, and, and publicized by, by journalists and by, by commentators and op-ed writers, it, it was something that, that everyone could understand and everyone could grapple with. The second, the second reason is that it created an enormous paper trail for later court challenges. In fact, one of the, in at least one way, the bill's defenders were very glad that the Southern Democrats filibustered the bill. Uh, obviously, they weren't happy to have to stay in the Senate for that long and to have to uh, run the risk of losing. But they were able to lay out thousands of pages worth of arguments in favor of the constitutionality of the bill. Everything that was in the Green Book made it into the congressional record. And that meant that when the Supreme Court and other courts went to the congressional record to find out, well, what, what happened? What was, what was going on in the bill during the debate? What did people think they were doing? This is, you know, which is a very important part of any legal, any judicial consideration of legislation, of the constitutionality of it. They go and look at the paper trail. And they say, well, what, you know, what were people thinking? What's, what's the argument there? Let's first defer to them a little bit, see if they have some ideas. And there it was. And it was laid out by guys like Dave Filveroff as well as guys like Pastore and Humphrey. And the debate also provided evidence that Congress, if nothing else, Congress had given a long, hard look at the constitutionality, regardless of what was actually decided. That, that Congress had really seriously taken to task this question. And, and in the end, approved of it. I'm not everybody, obviously, but by a large majority, the Senate passed the Civil Rights Bill. And, and that made it more likely that a court, particularly a court like the Warren Court, was going to defer to Congress. They were going to say, well, we're not going to second guess the legislative process. We agree on basic level that, yes, this is constitutional. And clearly, the voice of the people has decided that. So we're going to pass. And that's a real, a very important reason why the Supreme Court very quickly, in heart, the Heart of Atlanta case, was able to say, yes, 9-0, we think this is constitutional. Large part of it was simply saying, we agree with Congress. And we find a paper trail that establishes a very strong case for constitutionality. Now, above all, though, I think what the defense of the bill, what this constitutional defense of the bill made clear was that America had changed as a nation. A lot of the arguments that were being put forth, defense of private property, Bork's question about liberty, were things that had kind of always been there as arguments against any federal action and defense of 
civil rights, any state action in defense of civil rights. And yet what the drafters of the bill were saying and what the defenders of the bill were saying were, was, let's set aside the moral component. America has changed fundamentally, and we as a country now have to deal with this. We're no longer in a place where individual states can deal with this. We're in a place where we have to find a constitutional way to enforce and to expand civil rights. And in this sense, the Civil Rights, was, the civil rights Act was one of the last instances of the, the New Deal Constitution in which lawyers argued, and, and the courts agreed largely, that the nature of modern society and the economy necessitated a more powerful, more interventionist central government. In the 1930s, this was mostly focused on economic intervention. But in 1964, Congress decided, and the courts concurred, that such intervention was both necessary, morally necessary, and constitutionally permissible in social realms as well. And while we have seen over the last few decades a slow rolling back of some elements of, of the Civil Rights Act and, and some elements of its successor or, or twin bill, the Voting Rights Act, uh, we have not yet seen the willingness on the part of really anyone, uh, Rand Paul aside, to question the fundamental justification for this kind of action. Whether in the face of legally sanctioned or legally permitted discrimination against African Americans, the federal government had the power and the right and the requirement, the responsibility to step in. We shall be grateful that the Department of Justice, the White House, and Congress found the intellectual and political courage to make that case. Thanks to their efforts, we have the Civil Rights Act. And as a result, as a result we live in a better, more just America. I thank you very much.